Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. I am Michelle for Casa Elm. Oh, got an ad over here. Okay. <laughs> There's always an ad popping up. So YouTube's got to make their money. So again, welcome back to my channel. Again, this is Michelle Wedderburn. I'm located in central Mexico in San Miguel de Allende. Um, if you all haven't heard of it, we are in the state of Guanajuato. I've been living here for five years as an expat. Uh, this evening, I'm so excited to speak to Dr. Gerald Hassel and also Omar Buckner. They both live in Puerto Morelos, which is located in Quintana Roo on the Cancun side. Um, we've kind of crossed paths on the internet several times. I think that kind of is the case for a lot of people. Um, but I wanted to speak to them because they both come together to do a retreat for Black men. And I hope there will be some Black men watching tonight because this is really a beautiful, very necessary um, event that they are going to both co-host. And in our continuation of talking about emotional decolonization and just healing, um, really coming together in a space and holding space for things that are really key for us to break a lot of the generational traumas that we've experienced in our culture. So in all of those things, um, I have been really trying to connect with a lot of guests who are doing work in these spaces. So I was able to um, meet Dr. Gerald Hessel online and we had some conversation. He told me about his retreat and then I've actually been on some of Omar's uh, Zoom calls. I, I want to say almost two years ago, you started to do, was it Ubuntu calls um, or Zoom calls, maybe around the pandemic. So I didn't know you both were working together. So I'm very excited to have the opportunity to speak with you about your upcoming things. They both have been here in Mexico. So you're going to talk a little bit about your experiences living here as a Black man, um, the differences, where you're from, et cetera. So before we get into all of that, um, I want to say thank you all for being here. Um, we are here to basically help anyone who's interested in relocating or learning more about Mexico, mostly central Mexico. I have my guest house, which is Casa Elm at casaelm.com. We provide a soft landing experience for those interested in visiting, um, exploring the possibility of living here, or just want to kind of roll through, you know, we're there to make that easier. So thank you all for being here. That's my goal and purpose. And I want to say welcome to Dixie and Kim. Hi, thank you all for coming through. Um, she said it, she shared this information with several men from her family. Excellent. So we'll start with Dr. <laughs> Dr. G. Uh, okay. Tell us where you're from and a little bit about yourself. Yes, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. And um, so I'm from New York City. I grew up in the South Bronx and in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And um, my background is in clinical psychology. My doctorate degree is in clinical psychology. Um, I did my dissertation on the impact of father absence on African-American boys. Um, I've been involved with Black families, specifically Black men and Black adolescents since the 80s, doing rites of passage. Um, doing other forms of um, education, information type programs with youth and with Black families. Um, I moved here to Mexico mm -hmm. in 2021, I think so. January will be three years. So mm -hmm. three years ago, um, I was tired of the abusive relationship between me and the United States. Mm. Uh, I've seen the pattern of abuse since the early 60s and after George Floyd 
and the other series of, um, you know, murders. Um, and then with COVID, um, I just felt like I deserved better. I deserved mm -hmm. better. It's always been a dream of mine to live in a place where I've felt completely safe and uh, <clears throat> in a tropical setting. So I started doing some research and Puerto Morelos came up on my radar. Mm -hmm. My plan was to go to Playa and then maybe go to um, Merida. And Puerto Morelos came up on my radar. They had only had four COVID deaths at the time. Mm -hmm. I saw the small town on the beach. And um, I was like, wow, I really need to check this place out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure that we'll get into this in the decision-making process, but I'll just say it before I forget. Um, and so I made the decision to come here. And I think for people who are thinking about it, one of the biggest decisions that you can make is that when you come, it's going to work and you're going to be happy. I think that's one of the biggest decisions that I made. Mm -hmm. I made the decision that this <laughs> and that I was going to be happy. And with that mindset and consciousness, when I got here, um, the spirit of Puerto Morelos um, spoke to me. And I was like, this is it right here. I don't need to explore other places. This was it, it spoke to my spirit. And I've been here, uh, January will be three years and it's been incredible, beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I've grown exponentially in ways that I did not think about prior to coming here. And it's been one of the best decisions that I've ever made. My children come here, um, they just left, they were here for the summer, had a fantastic summer with them, they love it. And uh, so it's been an incredible experience. I love it, I love it. And I'm happy that you said, make that decision and you'll be fine. Like you'll be happy once you go for the things that make you feel better like you knew this was your spot right because you thought about this place that place but I think when you go to a place you just know that's for you and that's one of the pieces of advice I, I often give people I love San Miguel but it doesn't mean everyone's going to love San Miguel sometimes people come and they want to see other parts of Mexico um, but I think more importantly is you know you divorced the United States, right? Just had to keep it moving. So, yes. <laughs> I felt like that. It's like, look, this is an abusive relationship. <laughs> so, uh, I got it. You go. will not be hitting me anymore. <laughs> no, but no, honestly, that was one of my major reasons for moving was my Black son not raising him in the United States. People ask me that. I don't care what color they are, that is my answer. That yeah. is my answer, because that was truth. I was very, very uh, uncomfortable with the idea of him growing up there as a Black child. I really was. I still am. And I think that what people have to have to know and, and, and remember is that Mexico is a country, just like the United mm -hmm. States. So when you hear about things in Mexico, mm -hmm. you talk about something in a country, right? So right. there's something happens in Miami, people in Omaha, Nebraska don't say, oh, I got to leave the United States because mm -hmm. something happened in Miami, right? It's a country. It's things happen. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know, we hear things about Mexico, but it's, it's, it's Mexico City is bigger than New York City. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and it has nowhere near the crime that New York City has. Oh, I know. The blind leading the blind. So Omar, tell us about yourself and welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And what brought Thank you? you. Yeah, Thank you welcome. for having us. I um I call New Orleans home. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up there. I also call Chicago home. Mm -hmm. And I actually I moved here from Minnesota. Okay. January 14th, 2020, right before the pandemic really kicked off in the States, I was in an automobile accident and I suffered major injuries. I had a couple broken vertebrae, 
mm-hmm. broken ribs. And uh, I decided that when I was medically cleared, there was some question about, you know, the doctors were wondering if I could walk, how I would walk, you know, if I would need the assistance of a wheelchair. I decided that when I would walk, I knew I would walk again. And I decided that when I was medically cleared, I was going to change my life. I didn't know that meant that I'd leave the country, mm-hmm. but I wound up going to Chicago for rehab. I was immobilized for a few months. I had neck brace on my uh, from my middle of my chest to the top of my head for a while. I went through a number of different neck braces. And that process, once I, I, I did my treatment, my rehab, my occupational therapy, physical therapy, I traveled around the country. I got in a car with a good friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, and we left Chicago and we visited. We traveled through nine states in the U.S., nine, 11 states in the U.S. But on our journey, we knew we wanted to go to Louisville, Kentucky. This was all during the time. Uh, some background, right? I'm living in Minnesota. Rodney King, I mean, not Rodney King. Um, what's the brother's name? Who gets killed, who gets murdered by the police? And um, George Floyd. George Floyd, right? There's so many names, I can't even remember them all, right? Okay. George Floyd <laughs> situation happens in, in um, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Same time, the Breonna Taylor situation is going on. So I'm experiencing, I'm living not far from George Floyd Square. Um, and I decided that I wanted to go show some support. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that looked like. I just knew I needed to be there. And so mm-hmm. I went to Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, that was the one thing that I wanted to do on my on my journey. Another thing that I wanted to do was to go see Buckner, which is my family's last name, Kentucky. Uh, and that, the history briefly is that my family worked for some people in Kentucky, non-paid. They were unpaid. Mm-hmm. Uh for a number of years, generations, and then they were sold to a family in Mississippi where they walked. We were forced to walk from Buckner, Kentucky to, I think, Greensville or Greensburg, I forget which one, Mississippi. So I just, I wanted to go to that place in Kentucky. So by doing that, I also wanted to go to see um, the Martin Luther King, I mean, not, not the Malcolm, the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville. So I was able to do all of that. But that took me through a number of states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, I did Tennessee, Illinois, Indiana. And what I realized, this was also during the presidential election, that mm-hmm. as soon as I got 15 minutes outside of a, a major metropolitan area, whether it be Chicago, Pittsburgh, uh, Phil- Philadelphia, um, name one, as soon as I got 15, 20 minutes outside of it, it was rural America, make America great again, no more bullshitting the caravans, just hate, right? Rebel flags all over the place. And I knew that I did not want to live like that. Mm -hmm. In 1995, I I, I crossed the border to move to Belize. So I spent about 18 months in Belize, in in this part of the world, because I I wound up having to leave Belize. And so I, I traveled through Mexico. But that experience was important because I knew that I did not, I had a choice. I didn't have to stay in the States. Mm-hmm. And so I decided that when I was medically cleared, I would leave the U.S. And, you know, and so I explored some places. I thought initially that I wanted to go to Africa. I was thinking specifically about Ghana. And then I have two young children. My daughters are 13, 15 years old. They live in New Orleans so that I couldn't be that far away from them. Mm-hmm. And so I decided on Merida. And uh, I made arrangements to see, to continue my physical therapy in Merida. And um, I drove across the border. I was medically cleared on January 2nd of 2021. I left Minnesota on my way to Mexico uh, the following day on the 3rd of January. Took me a few days to cross to get through the state, stopping visiting family. And I crossed into Mexico January the 13th of 2021 Mm -hmm. on my way to Merida. And then my, my, my friend who I was riding with, her father got ill. Long story short, I had to find an international airport. I'd already driven through Mexico City. I was not going to do that again. And so the Cancun airport began, was my next choice. So I drove to Cancun because I'd been in Cancun on family vacations. I knew a little bit about the area and I knew it just wasn't my, my preference, my choice. Mm-hmm. And so I, I decided to explore other areas. And so I was one day I was on my way to Playa del Carmen. I got off the highway for gas and, uh, I went to the beach side, the port side. I met a couple of people. I got to talking to them. And I was like, well, I could do this. I could do this. And I did it. I found a place for two days. 
And then I, you know, that two days turned into two weeks. I got into a spot and just coincidentally, I moved into a spot a couple of days after Gerald moves out of the spot, oh, out of okay. Airbnb. And so I never met him uh, and didn't meet him for a couple months after, until a couple months after I had been here. But uh, it was just a feeling that I had about this town that it, it, it felt like home to me, you know. And um, you know, my reality is that I'm closer to my children right now across the border than I was when I was in Minnesota or Chicago. They live in New Orleans. So if I decide if I need to be in New Orleans tonight, I can get there. Uh, oh. It's an hour and a half away. So it's just because of its proximity to the Cancun airport, it, it, it makes it an ideal destination for me. And, you know. I, you know, I, I, I belong to a couple of communities. You know, there's, as you know, there's the African American community that you know we all belong to as when we relocate to this side, and that's important for me. As important to, for me is also a sober community. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm in recovery, so mm -hmm. this 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 town has a strong sobriety, sober community, both Spanish and English, and so I was able to make connections in both of those groups, and mm -hmm. just people have been very warm and very welcoming. And then I'll just say everything that. I have in any place that I've lived, the vehicle that I own or that I drive is because of relationships that I had and mostly through that 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 community. So uh, that that's why I settled on this place and I love it. I have no I mean, I, I tell people all the time two things. Breaking my neck was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. Leaving Me leaving the U.S. coming to Mexico is the best decision I ever made. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and I, I go on to say that, you know, we live in a town, if we hear a siren, we know that somebody's, that's a problem. Somebody, something's serious. We don't, you know, in the state, Chicago, New Orleans, that's just background style. You hear them all day long, all night long. But here, we don't hear them. You know, I can count on two hands the number of sirens that I've heard since I've been here in two years. And so for me, that, that stress, I don't have to deal with. I also say that I moved from being a second class, perceived as a second class citizen, over policed, um, to a place where I'm, you know, I'm perceived as a rich gringo, you mm -hmm. know, and so it's just an easier way of life for me on this side. And you know, and I, I'm a resident now, and so I have no intention of going back to the states other than to visit my children and my mother. I love it. I love it. So you both met in. This in Mexico, correct? Yes, correct. So you were living in an, a place and you moved out and then Omar took over. Yeah. The, yes. The black man's man well, cave. Right. Gee, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll start this story and you can add to it. <laughs> when we got here, there may have been nine black men in, in the town. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Not even, I don't think they've had many. But we were only, we were definitely the only two bald head black men with goatee. Right? And so everywhere I went, I was called Gerald. And I think Gerald, a lot of places he went, he was called Omar. Omar. And so, you know, I'd have to explain to people, no, I'm not Gerald. I don't even know the man. And then one day I'm going to my favorite fruiteria and I walk out and I see me, Gerald, riding up the street on the bike. And I knew exactly who it was. So I'm like, Gerald, you're like, Omar. What's going on, man? And so that, that's how we met. And we had been here maybe two months. Gerald arrived a month before I did. And so, um, yeah, it, it took us about a month or two before we actually met. Yeah. Okay. I love that story. So you didn't know each other, but now you do. And you're going to put a retreat together, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, I just want to say welcome to Controlled Chaos. Welcome back. <laughs> Naturally sweet desserts, welcome. Uh, welcome, Jetta. <laughs> si, hola a todas. Si, muchas gracias. So, um, yeah, so I, I love the story that you were getting confused or you were confusing the locals about who was who. We get that sometimes. Or are you family? We get that. We yeah. go out to eat in a group and everyone thinks we're all related. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay. Oh, we are related, right? Yes, we're all family. Um, okay, so you know, we talked we talked about kind of what brought you to Mexico. Um in regard to where you are, had you visited anywhere else, or was that just sort of you know where you ended up? I know that Omar, you drove, right? Did you drive down? Yeah. 
as well. How was how was that for you? Because I know a lot of people are curious about that. It was great. I've done it twice. And um, it's an amazing experience. You know, you really get a chance to see this, this beautiful country. And it, in a lot of ways, Michelle, and not in a lot of ways, but I sometimes, I meet Mexicans mm-hmm. who um, remind me of how privileged I am in that I've seen more of their country than many of my friends have. And so, I mean, I, I've been to, I don't even know how many states there, but I've been to at least a dozen states, have spent time in, in, in a number of cities. And um, I'm quite comfortable, you know, wherever I, I go in this country. And, and, and I move pretty frequently. Like this, this past weekend, I visited some, uh, one of my dear friends from Chicago who has a family home in Morelia. And I was able to spend the weekend there with him. But um, yeah, I've seen a, a much of this country. And I I, I started to talk about how in the mid-90s, I moved to Belize. Mm -hmm. I also, during that time, I got a chance to really, I mean, of course, this was 20, 30 years ago, very different, very different place. But I did see Oaxaca, Chiapas, Quintana Roo, Yucatan, the Efe, Guadalajara, Guerrero, Acoco. And so I, I, I... I love this country, you know, and I, and I I feel more at home here than I do in the States. I'm definitely more, you know, and I, I'll share this real quickly, is that my mother is 76 years old and she lives on in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. She sits on her porch with a pistol, <laughs> you know? So my sister has a couple wow. of pistols that she carries. And so for me, I mean, that's the norm, right? That's People don't stop at the red lights at night because of the fear of being carjacked. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not afraid. No, I mean, I am, I'm comfortable. We have children walking the streets, families, women walking the streets mm-hmm. late at night by themselves and in, in, in groups. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I leave the car windows unlocked, the doors unlocked, my doors are wide open. Mm-hmm. I just, I, there's a, a level of comfort that I have here that, that I could not have imagined, freedom that I could not have imagined in the U.S. That's true. Those are all great points. I mean, where I live, I feel very much the same. I mean, when I'm in more public places, you know, I'm a little bit more cautious, but for the most part, you know, my son can play outside. I do live in a development, but it's, I lived in a development in Florida and it was just a no, you know, I had to kind of make sure I was there watching him and things like that. So I think it's more about just kind of telling people and dispelling the whole idea that everything is you have to be afraid, right? Um, especially if you haven't been here or you haven't traveled to Mexico, it's just taking yeah. a lot of the negative stereotypes um, out of the the mix because we're here yeah. and we're living this experience. It's not like we just got here. We've been here for a few, I've been here for five years and I've traveled in and out of Mexico for over 20. And I love, I really yeah. do love this country as a whole. Um, I've traveled a lot in general, and definitely it's at the top of my, you know, top probably three places yeah. that I would choose to live. Yeah. So I'm very yeah. grateful. Yeah. And the Mexican people, I'm sorry, they just really do it. They, they're they just very yeah. generous, um, typically warm and helpful if you need help and very welcoming in this regard. So yeah. I just wanted to talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I tell, just to kind of follow up on what you said, and, and G mentioned earlier, just about the perception. You know, mm-hmm. people <laughs> in the U.S. will buy into the, the hype about the danger and the narco and the drugs and the murders, assassination. My mother was concerned. Uh, there was a shootout at the border where two people with two Black Americans were killed, Black folks yeah, from the state that. were killed. Right. And so I got. The, the truth is, Michelle, I didn't know about, I heard about that from people in the U.S. And so everybody was concerned about me and my safety. And I, I had to tell my mother is that she has children and grandchildren in New Orleans and Houston. Mm-hmm. And where I live, we've been here for two and a half years. There have been three murders. Mm-hmm. One was a political assassination. One, another was a drug deal. The third one, I'm not real sure what, what that was about. But I remind her that in New Orleans, on Mardi Gras Day of last year, within 30 minutes of each other, on the same block, unrelated, three people were murdered. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, she should probably be a little more concerned about her grandchildren and her children who are on that side of the border than I am. I mean, exactly. than, than me, you know. Yeah, I think it's just that yeah. 
Go ahead, Dr. G, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I think one of the anticipated benefits of what we're talking about that I did is the opportunity to transmute the energy from vigilance, which you, you live with, you're born into in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't care where you live at. If you're a black person in America, there is a sense of watching your back to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So being able to transmute that energy from vigilance, fear, anxiety, into spiritual, emotional, personal growth has been totally unexpected for me. Right? I'm able to take energy from one area of my consciousness and my body and my emotions and redirect it into a totally different area. And, 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 and that benefit has been exponential for me. And, and that, that was not something that I anticipated. Yeah, I remember you mentioning this to me because we spoke before um, tonight, tonight about the retreat and just kind of having you as a guest. And I, and I thought that was an excellent point to make is that you can take focus off of the negative living and pour it into positive living and just the things that I think sometimes we we hear about, but we can't live it or experience it because we're one very busy, we're living in this kind of, you know, cloud of, oh, the color of my skin, because it's truth, especially for men. Um, I have to always be aware when I go out, you know, am I going to have a problem if I go to a nightclub or if I go to the mall, am I going to be followed and, you know, just kind of living conscious in this, this kind of constant state of to say worry, but I guess it could be conceived as this. Yeah. It's went about your, your environment. Exactly. Regularly. It's energy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So tell us about your, the Black Man's Self Mastery Retreat. I would love to know um, the focus, you know, what brought you to to this place, your purpose with it, goals? Even, even though Omar and I have just known each other for two and a half years, we both have backgrounds in history and doing this type of work. And this is one of the reasons why we're doing it now together, the synergy of it also. For myself, I have been involved with retreats and rites of passage programs and other programs for Black men and Black families since the 80s, right? And mm -hmm. so I know firsthand how attending retreats has like changed my life. I mean, mm -hmm. exponentially. Um, the Black Man's Think Tank, which used to be at the University of Cincinnati was something that was held every year. Naeem Akbar, Dr. John Henry Clark, you know, Malefe Asante, these powerhouse men would show up and, 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 and groups of Black men would show up. And the growth that came out of that was exponential. So my history is in that, dimension and domain. Uh, mm -hmm. And so self-mastery for me, which is is something that is my lifestyle and, and self-mastery is defined as disciplining the mind and body for the purpose of spiritual growth and service to others. And, mm -hmm. and so um, there are 70 keys to self-mastery that, um, that, that, that I've developed. And when Omar and I began to just kind of talk about the possibility of doing retreat. Um, the synergy was there, the excitement was there, and we saw a significant void that was there as well, a need uh, for one, information, education, and, um, and also to talk about men investing in themselves, right? Like this, this is an investment in self that pays off mm -hmm. over the course of not just your lifetime, but over the course of generations, right? And so Omar and I began to talk about this idea 
particularly when we were in Colombia, we talked about it. It began to take focus. And um, we're now looking at five incredible days where Black men, a small group, we're not having a project, small group of about 15 Black men mm-hmm. that will deep into themselves, dive deep into nature, which is going to be in the Mayan jungle at a beautiful resort, Mm -hmm. um, being able to connect with nature and have time for self, um, time for introspective, being able to connect with other black men and gain an international point of view um, with men who also have an international point of view and also are willing to invest. And so, this is this is this is really where the vision began to take place in our minds, and now it's it's becoming a reality. I think it's really incredible and also very important and necessary in regard to what you said with the generational things, like you know, healing and then providing these spaces for us to, as I say, us as people in general, you know, to be better for our children and for them to know that this is a healing that's going to take time and it continues to, you know, kind of overlap as as we move forward. Um, So for me, hearing this and also uh, another part of your retreat where you're going to sponsor some young men. Can you talk about that? Because I really think that's also very special and necessary. Yeah, Omar, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'll get started. Um, Gerald and I, like like you said, we've been talking about this this idea Mm -hmm. since November of last year, at least. Um, And one of the things that, that, that we both understand and recognize is that that how do we transfer this knowledge, this experience, this hope, this strength that we have, uh, and that, that, that the men that we expect to participate in this experience to a younger generation. So we absolutely recognize the importance of this intergenerational exchange. And we realize a couple of things. First is that brothers typically will not make a decision to invest in themselves. Right. And, and, and I include myself in that. We will not make that decision. Mm-hmm. Um, we may we recognize the value of an experience. Uh, we may, you know, see how it could benefit me, my, you know, my, my family. But when it comes time to writing that check, passing the credit card, I'm a, I'm a prioritize, I prioritize something else. You know, we, we, we travel, brothers, we travel. You go online, you see, we're doing it big, you know, mm-hmm. we do it big things, yacht parties and, you know, all, all white parties and, so we, we, we're traveling and, and we just felt like this was an opportunity. We will, we know that there's some men out there who, who are willing to make this investment, who want to do something more than go out, come back, you know, have a five, seven day experience, come back home and they have to show for it is cigars, a few bottles of alcohol, some pictures uh, and some stories and some lies, but, but that they could really bring back some meaningful, some impactful experience, uh, tools that they can use, as Gerald said, to, to expand not only their lives, but the, the, the lives of generations to come. Mm-hmm. So we, because we knew that men in general have a, have a, are not inclined to make an investment in themselves. Mm-hmm. We understand when the young men typically are not financially in a position where they can spend the kind of money that it, it takes or that it costs to, to take this kind of trip. Um, and that they don't have enough, many of them have not had enough life experience to recognize why this is important uh, and, and, and then begin to prioritize that. Um, and I got a big smile on my face right now, right? We just had another person register for the, I'm, I got my computer on the thing. And so we just had another person register for the retreat, which is fabulous. Uh, fabulous. I don't know who it is, but the money just hit the account. So that's it's today. That makes yeah. today a great day. Um, <laughs> Okay. And so, but back to my point is that because we recognize the importance of, of having young men participate in this process or this experience, 
we decided that we would be intentional about including them and that we would we would ask our friends, our community to help us get them there. And, and, and I got to tell you, Michelle, the response has been tremendous. People from all, you know, people I haven't talked to in 30 years, people I graduated from high school and have not seen them since that day have wow. responded. People I, I worked with 20 years ago have responded. And so we're now six weeks into the campaign, actually five weeks into the campaign, we have two scholarships paid for and, and the third which is partially paid for so we do believe we we, have, we will run the campaign through the end of january i mean i'm sorry through the end of december and maybe through january if we have to mm -hmm. but uh we feel pretty confident that we will be able to include four young men in this process and and, and our thing is show that we don't want them to pay for anything we want to cover mm -hmm. all the expenses and for the one thing we want them to do is to get a passport well, you have and to so have they, a passport. once they do that <laughs> you gotta have a passport right and so they get their passport, we will cover the, everything else associated with this trip Absolutely. and this experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Go ahead. What's the return on the investment? Mm -hmm. So the return on the investment is an increase in uh, creativity, increase in self-confidence, increase in worldview, mm -hmm. and commitment, an increase in discipline an increase in having the tools to master your life, right? An increase in your commitment to yourself and to your family, to your children, to your wife, to come home a better husband, a better father, a better man, right? This is the return on the investment, right? And so what we are encouraging Black men to do is to make that investment. And here's another reason that is, 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 has been revealed to me that is very important. Right. Spiritually, I, I, I began to see just recently is that black women are doing this work mm -hmm. and they are doing it disproportionately when compared to black men. Right. And so the feminine divine is assuming her rightful place back on the throne. She's been absent almost 2000 years. I mean, we talk about emotional colonialism, right, mm -hmm. colonization, right, this spiritual colonization and, and destruction. So the correction is already in place where the feminine divine is coming back mm -hmm. to. We're moving into 2024, right? 2024 equals eight mm -hmm. is a number of really synergy, correspondence as, as above, so below. And so part of this work spiritually is to begin to be a part of the initiative that creates equalization in the growth, in the work, in the commitment that Black men are investing in themselves so that they can be equally yoked to the Black men who are investing in themselves, right? Like we cannot just reproduce a system where one part of our community is elevating and accelerating, and the other part is not. Mm -hmm. Now moving into 2024, the feminine divine, we see it all over the world. Women, Black women in particular, are coming together, bonding, healing. And that has to also take place on the masculine side of the equation. And this is part of the spiritual correction. And I'm happy and excited to be a part of this spiritual movement is, is, is what I see, right? And so I think that's, that's, that's critical to understand that. Absolutely. I think so too. I wanted to give the dates to anyone interested. It's February 15th through the 19th, and it's going to be in Puerto Morelos where you all live. And um, all the details are in the description below their website, but I want to put that in here and just wanted to ask you, like, why do you think um, it's a little difficult for Black men to inv invest in themselves? What, what would you say you've experienced in your, you know, history or your work with, with men in this regard? Yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I think that it's, I think that it's, it's, it's men in general, not just black men. I think mm -hmm. that all colors and races um, probably lag in terms of investing in themselves. We could look at the health outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. What's the investment of men in America 
in terms of their health, right? What's the investment uh, of men in America in terms of their emotional health, right? With the divorce rates, right? So I think it's men in general. I think that the Western culture values and places more of a value on doing things instead of being things. Mm -hmm. And so investing in self, you're investing in your being, right? Now you can also invest in your doing as well, right? Like I invested in a doctorate degree in terms of time and energy and all of that, right? And we do that. But on the other side of the equation, in terms of investing and your emotional growth, your spiritual growth, right? Um, there has not been as high a value in understanding the return on that investment as it might be in education, because now I can get a job and do A, B, and C. Right? But in the correction that is currently taking place, those people who thrive, because the economy is changing, mm -hmm. those people who thrive are going to be thriving as a result of who they're being. So in terms of what they are doing, right? And, and so when we talk about being, what are we talking about? Are you being an in integrity? Mm -hmm. are, you, are you being creative? Right? Are you being consistent, persistent, disciplined? Right? When, you, when we talk about and we hear from people who are most successful, these are the qualities that they invest in. Mm -hmm. Are you being accountable? Right? And so I think that um, the opportunity that presents itself with the self-mastery, the Black man's self-mastery retreat, is to gain the tools that allow you to expand your being. Right? And so for Black men, when we talk about the, the archetypes of masculinity, the king, the warrior, the alchemist and the lover mm -hmm. is to direct and invest energy in each four of those archetypes for the purpose of mastering self. Right? So I think that is part of the Western culture that focuses on the material. Right? When we go to the other side of the world, we see a very different culture that doesn't focus on the material. It focuses on the spiritual, right? Exactly. We see it in Asia, right? Mm -hmm. That is the we see it in Africa, mm -hmm. right? But I think that um, we have been drinking this Kool Aid now for several several centuries, but um, we're now coming to the correction. The correction has already started. Right? We see an increase in plant medicine, for example, mm -hmm. understanding and utilization of plant medicine. Right, standing that the earth, Mother Nature, has the answer to all of the illness and sickness that we experience. Right, but you don't go to nature to do; you go to nature to be, to be connected. Right, it's in our being. Right, we connect with nature and our being until we can transcend that consciousness to understand that we are nature itself. Right, and so the black man. Self mastery retreat is an opportunity to dive deep into those waters, to connect with other men who dive deep into those waters. When we have conversations with men, right? I had a conversation, and, and this is this is the norm. Like when a group of black men sit down and have dinner, they typically close the restaurant out because they enjoy being with each other and talking with each other, and it doesn't happen often enough. Right. Right. And so this is something that we have created a sacred space uh, to dive deep, to be close to the Caribbean ocean, to go and dive into a cenote, to eat natural food. Every man that comes to the retreat will get a full body massage to be pampered, mm -hmm. right? Every, um, every room has its own private garden where you can sit, be still and meditate, right? Mm -hmm. This is an experience that will affect generations in the family. And, and, and that's why I'm, I'm so excited about it. This sounds amazing. Tell me when you do one for women. 
<laughs> no, but I, I think this is great. Um, what would you say your uh, ultimate takeaway or goal would be for someone leaving the retreat? Um, you know, of course, to be better and, you know, self mastery, but kind of just you're coming here and we want you to go with this. And do you have um, kind of like a continuation of the things that they will explain, um, be a part of an experience during the retreat after? Yeah. You want to talk about that, Omar? Yeah. You know, Michelle, one of the things that, that we really, as we talk about this, Dr. G has, has come up with the seven keys to self-mastery. And that will be, that will drive the retreat. And so the, the men will walk away with those two that they can incorporate into their practice. One of the things that 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 G, you will hear G talking about it, and, and I don't know if I always, we, we both, we use the same language, is, and I think one of the reasons that we connect is that we both have a practice and it, it's something that we're committed to. Um, you know, we have a pretty regular routine that um, that that we are committed to because we know that it makes us better fathers, better brothers, better sons, better friends. And um, so we're committed to we are the, the, the seven keys to self-mastery will be the will be the driving force behind the retreat that as important, I think, though, is the time away from the states, a time away from the hustle and bustle, a time for men to relax, to rest, to restore, to decompress, to connect with nature in the jungle as well as in the ocean. We have a day planned on the beach. Most of our time will be spent in the jungle. And as G described, the, you know, it, people may have this idea about jungle being tree houses and that kind of, but we are, that is not going to be our experience. It is a, it is a resort in the jungle. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so we, we, we've been serious about not over-programming this retreat. And so men will have time, have that time to, to take care of themselves uh, in a way that they don't normally get to do. Like G mentioned the massage. That's one thing that we, every man that, that, that comes to the experience will have. Um, and so really we want our, our participants, the men who leave this experience to re return home feeling energized and inspired. I mean, that, that's, that's the language that we use. And we have, you know, we, we see this as a, you know, we, we have, we are moving into a new industry. We, we've created self master retreats international and we are, we are in the business of hosting retreats. And so whether or not this is a series of retreats, we're not sure, but we do know that this will be a continuum. This is not a one and done deal. We're creating a community, we're building community here. And so, you know, our, as, as an organization, as a group, uh, Self Mastery Retreats International, our mission is to create opportunities for men to reach their full potential, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritual, spiritually. And we do that over the course of a lifetime. So we want to engage Makai, your, your 11 year old son, Mike. when he's mm -hmm. Mike, 16, 17 years old, and we want him to be a, be a part of this uh, and for him to, to share with his his children, your children, your children's grandchildren, your children. And so uh, we are in this. We are in this for the long haul. Dr. G has a life. I mean, his life work speaks to his commitment to to, to black men and black families. And so um, this is just the next stage of that work. You know, and it, it, and I think the fact that we are here brought us to this point. I, I've been telling G recently, just as I look at where I am, um, I just think I look at my life and everything that I've been through, the good, the bad and the ugly has led me to this place. And I believe this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Uh, and so, and I believe that this retreat is the exact work that we're supposed to be doing. Gerald and I are together. I don't believe in coincidence. And so, uh, when I look at our skill sets, our experience, our backgrounds, we complement each other very well. And uh, I, I just expect this this experience to be the first of many retreats where we begin to build community. Um, and so, we're excited about it. I'm excited for you all. Um, I think it's absolutely wonderful um that you're doing this um you know the healing is necessary and i'm i'm glad that 
you're in Mexico and you're doing it in a place where people can find that down time to decompress and to be in a space like, as you said, I know that I've always been about getting and taking care and self-care. I mean, sometimes, yeah, we get a little carried away. I get carried away with my work and being a mother and all these things, but I do make time for meditation, uh, for healing, for temet scales. Now that I'm in Mexico, massage, whatever it is. And I think it's equally important for men to do the same. Um, and even to normalize that it's not a feminine thing, right? Taking care of yourself is not feminine. You have to do this. It's necessary. So kind of breaking, I think, some of those norms or those stereotypes that, you know, I know growing up, there's all, there's been a lot of that, you know, I'm tough. I'm a tough, you know, man. I'm a tough black man. You can still be tough, but you still need to take care of yourself. Even from the health perspective, I think it's always a challenge sometimes to get men in general to go and check something out, right? If you have a, a issue or ailment or health challenge to go and get checked out. Um, or even, you know, flying under the radar with mental illness, things like this, getting that help, getting that help and um, recognizing when the help is necessary. So I really do think that this is a a grand step in the right direction, what you're doing. There's an expression, you know, better to be a warrior in the garden than to be a in the war. Exactly. And, you know, as a warrior, my job is to take care of myself, to preserve the peace. Mm -hmm. Taking care of myself is all a part of that. Absolutely. Right. You know, and as we approach this work, we're, we're looking for models, for examples, for people to, to learn from, to experience, to who, who are willing to share their experience. And we have gotten tremendous support from women, from women, black women in particular have been very, black women retreat hosts have been very generous with their time and experience and expertise to us, with us. Uh, and even, you know, even white women are encouraging supporters. Mm -hmm. But we'll, what we've learned is that there's nobody doing this. There's nobody doing this. And so we believe that that, that we're on to something mm -hmm. and that that this is going to be something like we talked about. I mean, I mentioned earlier, this is this is, I think, this is a lifetime. This is this is going to be something that we do. I had a guy tell me that if you have some. He told me two things. He runs the biggest retreat facility in Puerto Morelos. He, he hosts a retreat every weekend at his site. Um, I went to visit his site knowing that we couldn't really afford it for this retreat, but maybe for the next one or the following. But uh, he told me that if you make $1 off of your first retreat, you, you will be a retreat host. And then he also said he's that he predicted that, that we will be retreat hosts. He's like, he's been doing this work for over 20 years and he has not seen this, what we are, what we are planning, he's not seen it. So uh, we were encouraged by that, you know? And so, it, it, you know, if you Google Black Men's International Retreats, there's one there's one thing that comes up before our retreat, and that was from 2018, I believe, and that, that, that the group is that, that defunct. And so we, we believe that we are creating an opportunity for men to plug into that that, that does not exist. I think it's excellent. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dr. G. And there are men who are in corporate America. We've all been in corporate America. There are doctors and lawyers, people in government. Um, there, there are Black men who are higher achievers. And um, to recognize the need to restore, to recharge, to replenish, so that you can continue to thrive professionally and personally, mm -hmm. this is the opportunity that we're bringing. Right. This is not for the masses. Right. This is for those men who recognize the value of investing in themselves and recognize the return on the investment and building community, networking, not only in the United States, but around the world. 
And this is this is the time that we're in, the 21st century. This is what this is about. <laughs> you know, so um, you know, for the brothers and for those women who wives and mothers and sisters who are listening to this, um, I like for you to see this as an opportunity to, as we spoke about, to decompress, to take care of yourself, but also to receive the return of investment on your creativity, your vision, your ingenuity, your energy, your vitality, your health. Mm -hmm. Because for me, again, the definition of self-mastery is disciplining the mind and body for the purpose of spiritual growth and service to others. When I, when I got on the path of self-mastery, I didn't see any definitions out there that really fit what was in my spirit. Mm -hmm. And so what you see is a lot of men smoking big cigars and drinking, you know, this is self-mastery. And so I'm, I asked spirit, to give me a definition of what it is. And so that's what came to me, right? And, um, and so this, this is about the one thing that really matters, which is longevity. Mm -hmm. Investing in your longevity, your health, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, right? Because the name of the game is longevity. If we can stay here long enough, We'll figure it out. All right. There's too many black men checking out way too early, way too soon. Mm -hmm. right. And so um, for those men who might be listening, um, we welcome you to come down here. We've created a sacred space. Uh, it's going to be powerful. It's going to be intimate. Only 14, 15 men. So we're not going to have a lot of busy time. It's going to be a lot of quality time for us to dive into ourselves and to dive into each other. And the relationships that are going to come out of this retreat are going to spawn entrepreneurship, brotherhood around the world. I'm confident about that. Absolutely. I wanted to um, say welcome because to Tracy. Um, and also to uh, Cheryl and Kathy and Asta. Asta commented and said she remembers growing up and seeing her dad and uncles and friends getting together, just talking and hanging out. Uh, there's nothing more loving than to hear the joy of men being around one another in a positive way. Um, and so this, I think, will kind of recapture some of the things that I believe have either not existed in many of Black men's lives, especially those who might have grown up in a lot of single um, parent households. And, um, you know, just having that opportunity to, like you said, create brotherhood. You know, we are creating a lot of sisterhood and a lot of sister circles. So it's time for brother circles, right? And, um, and, and, like I said earlier, normalizing that it's okay to go in inside and, and start to bond in other ways that I think we've been conditioned to not think that that's how we should be. And, and one of the things I wanted to comment about was, yeah, you know, the depiction that we get, I think, and the conditioning that we get from media, mostly in the United States, from music, from uh, movies, videos, and all these things is, you know, you have to be uh, rich and cool. And you need to, like you said, smoke the cigars and who's drinking the name brand uh, alcohol and all the, you know, all the, all the stuff that's put in front of us. It's, it's all consumerism and it's conditioning. Um, one of the things that I can say I'm very grateful for is I feel very removed and detached from that living here. Part, the biggest part is that just, I don't have TV. I don't watch TV. I don't miss it. Um, you know, nothing wrong with those who want to watch it and whatever. But when I, when I do have the opportunity to watch television and I watch ads and I see the ads, I just, 
it hits me, right? I did um, in my newsletter this week, I talked about um, reverse culture shock. So when I go back to the United States, I experience a lot of reverse, reverse culture shock with uh, cost or just things, you know, it's not all negative, but um, I, I, I forget, you start to forget some of these things living abroad. And um, one of the things for me that is kind of a negative is watching ads. You know, I see so much strong negative messages for ethnic groups, right? Uh, The commercials that are like about HIV, mostly you're seeing ethnic faces. It's subtle enough, but I noticed that, you know, we are depicted in a lot of very subtle messages and negative ways and things like that. So back to the messaging that I think a lot of us receive growing up, the, you know, we love our Black music, but I do think at the end of the day, who's writing the check and the messages that we are getting from this, especially nowadays, you know, I see uh, so much like just normalizing things that for me, I just think, wow, you know, this is kind of scary. What's it going to be in 10 years? Um, you know, whatever your choices are, you know, whatever preferences are out there, that's okay. But I don't think it's okay to, um, to impose this on a young mind. I really think young minds, are still developing and they're still trying to figure out a lot of things. So I just find it very interesting when I return to the US, I I, um, have a lot of those like kind of things that hit me. And I just think it's quite sad sometimes that the things that are important in the stereotype is really not important, right? Because it's not spiritual, it's not inner work it's not inner growth, it's obtaining cash money so you can buy things, right? Is that being, that's not being. So I'm very excited about what you all are doing. I think it's very necessary and the trickle will turn into a drip and a waterfall. I do think it's it's incredible. So I applaud you both for coming together and creating creating this i really do and yeah. i hope you'll get you. sold out you guys yeah. thank you michelle you know i, I just want to point out, i think it's telling mm-hmm. i think it's telling and i think it reaffirms this the facts it's not an idea the fact mm-hmm. that black women have been the caretakers of our mental emotional financial health when you just ran off the list of names i didn't i, I may have been mistaken or maybe i did not hear man a man's name mentioned uh, and so out here, there might be right. one hiding in the background. If there mm-hmm. is, feel right. free to drop a comment. Yeah, we'd yeah. like to hear a little something. But, you know, in, in our planning to launch the retreat, mm-hmm. we realized that this might be the case, that women might be more inclined to listen, to participate. And so we are having monthly information sessions really? uh, and we're doing them the third Tuesday of each month. You can find out at our website and we'll give you the information. We'll put that in the, in the chat. But uh, we are encouraging sisters. We are encouraging women to share the information session meetings, the times and the links with men in their lives so that they can come and hear from Gerald and I. They can ask any questions that they might have about what to expect in that experience. We also are asking um, so, so, so share on their social media. If you can share mm-hmm. our links on your social media, we'd appreciate that. Okay. And then the two other things that we're asking is one, if you would just have a conversation with, with the men in your lives, whether it be your son, your, your brothers, your fathers, your nephews, your, your spouse, your partner, just uh, about investing in their personal growth. Just have that conversation, see where they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to to be get, get to begin them thinking or to encourage them to think more about investing in themselves. Mm-hmm. And then, then, then lastly, we are asking that you support our scholarship initiative, sisters. And so we will also have that in the in the chat. And that is that is going to ensure that four young men who are between the ages of 18 and 24 mm-hmm. have the opportunity to participate in this experience. So we appreciate you showing up, not only today, but just for showing up. We appreciate Absolutely. you. We love you. What yeah. is your... Um... 
And I absolutely love what you guys are doing because like I said, when Mike is old enough, you're still doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing him there myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Drop him off and then I'll come back and get him. <laughs> What's your um, website? I'm going to put it in the chat. I don't have it. We actually, we what I can do is um, we use a we travel um, payment platform that will okay, send you directly good. to the information and the brochure on the retreat. Um, and that is a very long email. I mean, a very long URL code, but let me see if I can shorten it and I can give it to you. All right, okay. now this is, this is the shortened version of it. And this will take you directly to our retravel payment platform. And again, you can get all of your questions about the retreat answered from this site. And it is the HTTPS colon... Mm -hmm. Hold on a sec. H okay. -P -P and I'm sorry, I'm on my phone, so I can't drop it in the chat. I tried a little earlier, but I couldn't do it. Uh, again, and that's two back backslashes. You know what? Let me, I'm going to go to, because it's in the description. It's in the description. Yeah. And then and the, I'm the other thing is this, and you paste just, it. Perfect. If you just Google the Black Man's Self Master Retreat, it shows up um, and it'll, it'll direct you to that page. But thank you, Michelle. That that will that link uh, will send them right to the page. And you can print out the brochure, share with the men in your the men in your lives. Um, and I believe all that we, we we were very intentional about making sure we answered any question that we could think of, and we shared it with a number of people. We, we were able to respond to their questions as well. Um, and so, although we don't have a website, we, we do have a social media presence. Mm -hmm. And um, our Facebook page is Self Mastery Retreats International. Again, that's Self Mastery Retreats International on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And then on Instagram, we can't use as many letters for our name. So it's Self Mastery Retreat. I -N I'm sorry, Self Mastery Retreats. I N T L self mastery retreats. I N T L. Okay. That is how you can contact us on um, Instagram, and we will get you that. I will. I will. Well, as soon as we get off this call, I will make sure that it is included in your comment section. Okay, and I've added um, those things in the description, so they are there for those who are watching. <laughs> you have access to all the details, the link that will take you to their page. Their page has all of kind of like a description of what to expect um, about this retreat. It has the dates, it has the cost. It's a link that brings you directly to We Travel. I dropped it in the chat. That link will bring you directly um, to all of the information that you need. And, you know, even if this is not something you can make in February of next year, Please share it. Um, I know the ladies will continue to support you. You know, maybe you can come back on in a couple, two months or so and talk about it some more. Um, I absolutely love that you all are sponsoring for young men to have this experience. Um, I don't know what the criteria is. Maybe you want to talk about that. Is that like an application process for anyone who might be in the audience and has a son that they want to uh, send? So interview process where we will do the interview via Zoom and, and uh, also have them do maybe a short composition on why they think this could value them. But well, we want to have eye to eye contact and connect with them. Excellent. 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 Yeah, we um we've been talking about that. And you know, with the access to this open chat GPT, we feel it's important that we we do the the in the in the interview. Um mm -hmm. just to see where they're coming from and, and see how we connect. And uh, and so we will as we determine criteria interview dates we will absolutely make that information available and our hope is that we not our hope we will interview every young man who uh who who expresses interest and until we until we find the four and and this is something that well because we haven't talked about it, i won't say it but yes yeah, so until we find the four we will the process is open um 
we do want to identify the young men early and so that they can have a chance to make whatever arrangements that they need because it may require that they, depending on what, what their school situation is, that they have to request time off of school or off of work. So we want to get them as much notice as possible. So we will, one of the things that we consider is identifying them as we earn, as we raise the money for a man, identify one, and so that they can get started to what make whatever arrangements they need to uh, make sure that they can participate. Excellent. I think that's excellent. And also get your passports. If you want your husband's sons to join, just get your passport as soon as possible. If you don't have one, check and make sure it's not expired if you have one so that, you know, you're, you're ready for this yes. experience. Um, and I think that you will have the utmost success with it, um, I do think that the women are here because they're sending me messages. <laughs> Cheryl said, my husband will be watching the replay. I want this for him. Yes, Cheryl's a, a client that came to Casa Elm recently. Um, and Asta, she is a massage therapist. And she said, almost all of the men say that their wife made them come <laughs> to get a massage. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, you know, well, you know I think we have um, there have been three women, three black retreat hosts who have been very supportive in our thinking this through, planning it through, just sharing all of whatever we ask for. And they all say the exact same thing. When they close a retreat out, the women they and they, they they work primarily with black women. The women say that they want this experience for the men in their lives. Absolutely. And so we are responding to that call. Absolutely. A woman that, that I know that um, Omar and I know, she just reached out and um, we're talking about using her condo, which is a beautiful condo on the beach, it sleeps five people. Mm -hmm. So if there's some men who want to bring their wives, um, we will be able to have a condo and a beach experience where they can spend the five days um, and relax as well for themselves. Excellent. I think it's fantastic. And when you're ready to bring your retreat, the next one to Casa Elm. Love that. We have a five bedroom home that's available for that. Absolutely. And we will support all those efforts, but I think it's just a phenomenal um, idea. And I think that it's the start of something very, needed, very necessary um, for us. Uh, so I really wish you all the best to success, success with this. For anyone who's watching, you. Um, you know, do you have a subscription? Like if people are interested, kind of like a email sign up when they go to the link? We, we have an email address and if they reach out to us, yeah, if they reach out to us by email, we will make sure to respond within 24 hours. Okay. Uh, we'll send them out the information and we are available to answer any questions within a 24 hour turnaround. That email address again is gmail uh, gmail.com. And it's the same as our self mastery. So, I mean, as our Instagram. So it's self mastery retreats, I N T L at gmail.com. And I repeat that self mastery retreats. I-N-T-L at gmail.com. Okay, for international, I'm typing it in the chat. Okay, and one more time, it's self-mastery retreats, I-N-T-L. Okay. At gmail.com. It's there. So if you're interested or you want to share more details with the men in your lives, please reach out to them. Um, get anything you need to know on the link, send an email, um, encourage your brothers, your, your uh, spouse, whoever, the black men in your lives to sign up. Um, I'll tell you that I shared this with um, Micah's dad, who is very much in alignment with the same types of things that you all do. And he has an, an enormous following in Miami. Uh, the name of his organization is called African, that's K-I-N dot org. And he said he was going to find a way to work it into his newsletter. I sent it to him last week when we had a talk, a conversation, Dr. G. So 
Um, I really, really wish you all the best with it. And I think we should circle back. We'll come back and maybe get on and talk about um, this a little bit more. So just so you all, before your retreat, the dates are February 15th through the 19th, 2024. It's happening in Quintana Roo, which is in Puerto, well, Puerto Morelos, Morelos in Quintana Roo, and they would fly into Cancun Airport just for anyone who might want to do some research on the area and just figure out like how much would it cost for the plane tickets and things like that's probably already on your website. Um, but you know, that's a good start to see, you know, is it something that's in your, your, uh, financial range? Yeah. So anything else you want to share with us? Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, we do have, uh, there's a, we have two different options for men who, to participate in payment options. That mm -hmm. information can be found at that link mm -hmm. uh, of our We Travel, we travel uh, payment platform. And we also have installment plans, so you don't have to come out of pocket. We do have a $500 deposit mm -hmm. that is non-refundable. I'll put that out front. It's non-refundable. And then we have a, an installment plan. So we are, we are working with men's budgets. And um, we, want, we just wanted as many... Folks, now we want to, we're going to have 14 men participate in this, and we're excited about it. Uh, we do want it. We don't want to create stress or cause any frustration. So we are, we are, uh, we're working to to make it as easy as possible, and we are available to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, like I said, within a 24 hour turnaround. Excellent. And one one more question, I think. <laughs> what about the? Are you both? I know you're co-hosting. Are you the? Uh, facilitators, or do you have any other facilitators that will participate? Yes, I will be doing um, facilitation on the seven keys. So throughout the course of the four days, we'll be going over the seven keys to self-mastery, right? Which is um, something that we'll be diving into each day. And we will also have um, other facilitators that focus on um, body movement type uh, um, experiences, uh, yoga, um, in terms of starting the day. We're looking at definitely having um, a cacao ceremony mm -hmm. that will be done by a Black man and um, some other people who are engaged in holistic healing as well that Excellent. will and be a part of the experience. Excellent. Excellent. And I know you mentioned, you know, one I did thing, have another question. Gerald, Go I ahead. Had... <laughs> Omar. You no, know, we had this conversation today and we've actually, it's been an ongoing conversation. One of the things Gerald did mention is that we'll start each morning with a meditation practice. We have a, there's a brother here in town who's agreed to lead us in facilitation uh, in facilitating that component. Mm -hmm. And we are looking for black men facilitators. We are, we do see though an opportunity to to integrate a feminine energy. So we are committed to having black facilitators, mm -hmm. and we are looking. You know, in, in this this community between Cancun and Tulum, there's so many black folks who are doing this work that we feel like we can get local folks. But we are also talking to folks from across the diaspora who might be able to come in. Uh, we might be able to work something out to come in and, and support this endeavor. But um, Excellent. so we we haven't identified, with the exception of one, we haven't confirmed. So we know who's going to lead our meditation, but we're still talking to a couple other men about how we can work them into the retreat. Excellent. It'll come together. You have time. I oh, think absolutely. The, con absolutely. the concept is there, the idea, um, absolutely. the goals exist and yeah. then you know, once you get down to the day-to-day -day, you'll yeah the yeah. universe will provide you. you all the people that need to be there for yes. this mm -hmm. and each participant of you know, the book the seven keys to self-mastery mm -hmm. along with um, a t-shirt that says the black man self-mastery retreat and some other things that would be a part of the packages Right. So the book will be a workbook that allows them to actually begin to develop their own practice mm -hmm. and begin to also continue the work of self-actualization prior to coming to the retreat, during the retreat, and when they leave the retreat. Right. And so they will have 
a workbook that has the seven keys that they can continue to dive into and um, and learn and explore. Excellent. Well. That's excellent. So I had a question because you mentioned, um, you know, we've been on off talking a little bit about plant medicine and in your experience, have you seen kind of a more openness towards this or these um, practices in Mexico compared to when you were living in the U.S.? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All over the world. <laughs> I mean, you know, there is an openness and receptivity to plant medicine that is scientifically based mm -hmm. because research is being done. And so there's empirical evidence that shows that certain types of plant medicine are highly effective in treating depression, PTSD, trauma, anxiety, right? And so um, there are some people that are exploring psilocybin, um, exploring ayahuasca, right? So definitely, particularly here in Guantanamo Ru, um, all of the way from Tulum to Cancun, we're seeing people that are actually coming into the country to experience plant yeah. Most for the most part, 95% of them are, are women, black women. Mm -hmm. But this is based on empirical evidence. The science is, is there, but also in terms of generational evidence. Our ancestors introduced plant medicine to the world. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a return back to what we know has been effective for tens of thousands of years, right? And, and it's also part of the correction of the feminine divine, assuming her rightful place back on the throne, right? She is letting us know that the cure is in me, mm -hmm. right? Earth, everything that you experience in terms of illness or sickness, that I have the cure for you. And so more and more people of color are becoming open to um, to plant-based medicine, and um, there's scientific evidence that backs it up. So, in your opinion, um, you know, because I've had this conversation off and on over the past few weeks, because we've been talking a lot about emotional decolonization, um, plant medicines, and just a lot of things that are in, line, in alignment with you know, healing um, from the retreat ideas to, you know, last week we spoke to um, someone about, you know, alchemist, intimate alchemy and things like this. But in your opinion, you know, the fear that we have exists through the conditioning. Do you, do you have anything that you want to kind of just give us a short reason that I think people that might be in a space, I will say a mental headspace where it's hard to comprehend or to accept or to maybe digest this because we have been raised this way, right? Um, I know I grew up in a very uh, Pentecostal situation and I'm not going to blame it on church, but I'm going to say there's always been a fear around the unknown of what does this mean? And I did speak about this a little bit last week, um, but now we're being kind of reintroduced to things, but we're also living, I think I'm living in a space where I'm learning more about the world in general, not just through travel, but by living here and especially about um, the concepts behind plant medicine. Yeah, that's a fairly recent phenomenon in the Black community, mm -hmm. right? really, really in the past two generations. My grandfather was an herbalist who was born in Sabre. My, and you have, you have some background in the islands. Mm -hmm. Grew up in the, in the South because we were not even allowed to go to hospitals, right? Mm -hmm. um, people who grew up in the South two generations ago, they went in the backyard, in the garden, in the woods and got to get their medicine. Mm -hmm. So this is a fairly recent phenomenon 
uh, in the Black community as we have moved into urban cities, as uh, uh, medicine has become um, colonized, commercialized, profitized, right? And so it's also a way of maintaining control, right? If I can get you on synthetic substances that disconnect you from the earth, disconnect you from, from yourself, and they don't promote healing, but they promote dependency, this is the model that we've seen for the past two generations, particularly in the Black community, right? Like I've, I've worked in mental health since the 80s, right? And so I've seen the overprescription. We know this, right? The overprescription of Ritalin, the overprescription of antidepre antidepressant medications, of, of psycho psychotropic medications, right? Mm -hmm. overly, med overly prescribed in the Black community, mm -hmm. right? You know, this is the case. And so I think that the um, the increased interest in plant medicine has also come out of the experience, the history, and the knowledge that this other stuff is not working. Mm -hmm. We have enough evidence to show that it's not working, right? As a matter of fact, scientific, we, we see the placebo effect in many cases, when you look at studies, the placebo effect is just as effective as the medication or even more effective than that medication, right? right? So mindset is a huge contributing factor to, um, to um, you know, these outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is something that has happened in the past two generations. You know, your grandparents, my grandparents, Omar, your grandparents, when they got sick, they didn't go to the hospital, to the emergency room. Absolutely. Right? They went to the backyard, to the woods. Right? Matter of fact, they were making tinctures, had tinctures. Mm -hmm. home, right? My grandfather was an herbalist. Right? And so I come from the Labonic, shamanic tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think that the history and the experience in the Black community with the overprescribing of medication is a contributing factor to people looking to alternative means of healing that are being empirically validated to be effective. Absolutely. And I think it's it's good to talk about those things because again, with our conditioning, we think going, you know, going to the doctor is our our norm in terms of the things we've seen. Um, you know, going to the backyard, as you say, but even growing your own things that you need or using a natural remedy, sometimes people feel it doesn't, it's not fast enough, but that is the natural way. It takes time for that healing to happen. Um, so I think it's important to talk about these things because I don't know that as a whole, if people realize that they're sicker because of all of the prescriptions and the recommendations and all these things. And with time, these things actually are not healing for your body. And, you know, I mean, we could have a whole other conversation about this, but I think it's very important to uh, learn about, you know, other healing properties that are not over-the-counter drugs or prescription drugs as well. So I just kind of touched on that a little because you mentioned plant medicines earlier. So, so, true. Um, so true. You know, when you look at other countries, mm -hmm. up to Europe, you don't see the over-prescribing of antidepressant drugs. Like you right. see a more homeopathic approach in Europe. Right. You see a homeopathic approach in Asia. Mm -hmm. You see a more Neopathic approach in Mexico mm -hmm. True. To, to, uh, to, to these diagnoses. And, mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, when you talk about chemical bondage and the trillion dollar industry of pharmaceuticals, um, you know, it, it, we, we understand why children as early as kindergarten are, are being prescribed medications to mm -hmm. control because it's trillion dollar business. Exactly. And the 30 
plus vaccinations that they give yeah. children. Yeah. Yes, and that doesn't happen in other countries either. No, no. And I think everything we're doing a lot of research about that when yeah, oh, so I didn't hear you. I was just saying just to be educated and informed, you know, there's 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 no there's no excuse not to be informed now. I met I, I met Omar's mother. She's in her seventies, and, and we were sitting on the porch. And uh, Omar asked her a question, and she said, "I don't know, Omar. Just Google it." <laughs> <laughs> That's what I tell my son all the time. He asks me questions. I'm like, "Google it." <laughs> That's true. We have access to a lot now just, nowadays. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Google it, Omar. <laughs> right. You got that. You got that. Well, guys, I won't yeah. keep you longer. Um, I appreciate you talking about everything you touched on tonight. And again, I think your concept is definitely the start of something grand. I really do believe that um, you'll get the sign up you're looking for and it will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. You have the people in this audience already that are very supportive. Kim and Jetta said it's so needed wonderful they're going to encourage everything that they um you know can where they can put it out there and i will continue as well to do that if you have um any kind of like flyers or anything like that send it to me via email and i'll be sure to sh share that on um, yeah. the two platforms that i have here in mexico um and i'm i'm very encouraged that you okay. are bringing young men help you find them non-chat gpt <laughs> compositions because <laughs> that's a good point you know i think yeah. everyone's using that yeah. a little bit they're dumbing us down through technology yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. anything else so, you want to well, thank you again michelle us? we appreciate you yeah someone thank as well thank you you've been a great host great questions and um yeah. fun yeah. Get the opportunity to share uh what we're doing Thank you. Absolutely. If anyone has questions, feel free Absolutely. to um, find more in the description box below. Um, you can bring go right yeah. to their link and you have the email, the email address, everything is there. Um, so for all of the women here tonight that had a voice and something to say, please do encourage the yes. Black men in your lives if you feel that they need this or even if they don't feel that they need it. Just, you know, get them to go there and read it. I do really believe that the description says a lot on the page. There's a lot of information there. Um, and I think it's going to be a powerful experience. So I'm very grateful to be able to be a part of sharing that for you. And if you have not hit the like, please do that. I, I should say this in the beginning and I just start talking. Subscribe to my channel. We have... Um, some very amazing uh, guests that we've been speaking to, including these two gentlemen. And um, next week, we're going to be speaking to, uh, what's his name? Michael Sol Cortez. And um, he will also be kind of talking about his journey as well as a Black man. So I'm going to make sure I tell him about your retreat. Um, he has a, a lot to say about his um, current purpose and you can stay tuned for that. I'll start sharing that as well on my platform. So thank you all for being here. Thank you thank both you for, for being here. I wish you yeah. the best. Do let us know right. how it goes. Um, well, all right. Have a good evening. And hold on one second. Right. I'm gonna and if you make it to beautiful Puerto Morelos yes. on the beach, weather high, still hot. So yes, yes, do check it out. Yes, it's nice. warm. <laughs> Hold on a sec. Okay, so.